Great to have you on the show. I'm so excited to talk whiskey and, in particular, Glen Murray with you. Um, it's been too long. We were supposed to do this in summer, so I'm so glad that I can finally, finally have you on the program because since then I have sipped a lot of your whiskey. So let's start talking about it. Why don't you um, introduce yourself to everyone? Yeah, so uh, my name is Ian Allen. I am the Global Brand Ambassador and Visitor Center Manager for Glen Murray Distillery. So uh, been doing that job is coming up to 18 years i have no idea where that time's gone but uh, <sighs> given that the last few months have flown by it's it's no surprise yeah it's crazy especially even these last three years these last three years so um wh- well what you know how did you get it get there how did you end up these last 18 years um i hear a scottish accent so i assume there was whiskey in your upbringing yeah, so uh, I, I was born in the town Elgin, uh, where the distillery sits. Uh, so this is my hometown. I, I moved away. I tried to escape, uh, but it, it drags you back in for some reason. Uh, so I went off to university in Aberdeen, um, came back to Speyside in 2001. I got a job at the McAllen Distillery there, first of all, managing their visitor center. And then an opportunity came up to a little bit closer to home. So I uh, took that opportunity uh, back in 2005 and have not looked back since. Now, you said you went to University in Aberdeen. What were you studying there? I absolutely nothing to do with whiskey. I was studying law and management, <laughs> although I, I spent more time in the bars in Aberdeen. Probably that's where I got pulled into the, the drinks industry. Um, yeah, I, I studied law and management, focusing on EU law, which given Brexit, it's probably a good idea that I didn't go down that route. Um, I certainly had plans to, to spend more time in Europe. But being a global brand ambassador, um, I got to do it and also spend time in bars. So life works out quite well sometimes. Um, so you were spending time in those bars while you were studying. What was it about the bars that kind of drew you back in or drew you back, to, back or should I say drew you to hospitality? I, well, it was actually, you know, traveling around Europe. Um, you know, I took a summer where I uh, spent a bit of time in Europe and sitting in bars and seeing distilleries with, uh, you know, so close to my hometown and thinking it doesn't matter where I go in the world. Uh, home keeps on sitting there talking to me. So uh, that was a draw. Um, but to be fair, whiskey was always a love, always something I enjoyed. Uh, so, you know, it really is, it's cliched. I know they say that if you do something you enjoy, you never work a day in your life. But it, it, it's true. You know, I, I love being a part of this industry, being around whiskey, whiskey people. Whiskey people are nice people. Uh, so it's great to be around these people. And, you know, that, that just pulled me in, to be honest. And um, you said that you were, you went all around the world, you were drisk- drinking whiskey. What, what, was it something that you drank at home? You know, did your dad or mom drink whiskey and was there a specific type that they preferred? Yeah, my dad was a, was a big whiskey drinker, so that makes him sound like he's had a problem, but he was, he loved, there was always single malt whiskey around the house. Um, his favorite was uh, Glendeveron. Um, so that was, you know, every year that was a, a nice, easy Christmas present for him. So uh, that was his tipple of choice. And, you know, th- there would always be a whiskey glass lying around, you know, when you were too young to drink, you'd always shove your nose in it and pick it up. And, you know, I think that just kind of stuck with me. And, uh, uh, you know, even, you know, going out with friends, you know, we, we would have whiskeys before we went out to bars and, you know, to go out and, and enjoy ourselves. Uh, so it, was, it always seemed to be around. Uh, it was always there or thereabouts, I think. And so when you, when you came back to Speyside and to um, the McAllen, uh, what were you, you said you were, you're heading up their, their experience, their whiskey yes. experience. Uh, what kind of things were you doing there? I, so whiskey tourism, it wasn't brand new, but it was certainly in its infancy compared to what it is today. And creating experiences around brands was um you know, generally unheard of. And really the focus was just on getting people in, doing tours of distilleries. And and it was very um, decentralized. You know, the, the, the ownership of brand homes was very much within the distillery. Uh, and there was always a conflict of interest there because you were working with distillery managers who had safety at the forefront of what they did. And then you were looking to take a busload of tourists who wanted to wander about and go touching hot pipes that they shouldn't have been touching. Um, and, you know, that, that, you know, that was kind of how it was. And we were trying to build this idea of an experience, um, creating, 
you know, different tours. You know, we had just begun back in 2001, we, we developed this idea of, of more in-depth tours. And back then, nobody was doing this, you know, where you paid a bit of a premium to spend a little bit more time. You got different whiskies. And that was the focus. And it was back then, it was a hard sell. Now, in whiskey tourism, that's where the focus is. People want to be more educated. They want to be more informed. They want to be closer to the brand and understand more about it. So, you know, being at the kind of um, forefront of that was, was kind of fun, but very challenging. So that was kind of what we were doing. Um, yeah, when you... This- yeah, no, when Sorry. you said 2001, all of a sudden it hit me. So you're there at uh, Glen Murray, you know, for 18 years. And if you think back, even 18 years, you know, this idea of an experience, I'm using, you know, air quotes, didn't even really exist. So in 2001, you know, what was it? Just like, you know, must have been such whiskey lovers, you know, really knew about the brands to even want to go up and visit a distillery. You know, you must have seen such a change in the tourist or the different kind of tourist from from then till now. Absolutely. It, it's night and day uh, compared to, you know, what it was back then. You know, you look at, you know, what is sur- the surrounding landscape of, of whiskey tourism with the development of the Johnny Walker experience in Edinburgh and all these, you know, massive, massive brand investments. And that's where, you know, it has become a more centralized approach, you know, and it's part of the the wider kind of marketing perspective of a brand is is that brand home experience. Uh, so, yeah, absolutely different. You know, it, it, here, you know, just if we're talking numbers, you know, basic numbers. Um, when I first started here, we had about three and a half thousand visitors. You know, pre-COVID 2019, we had 24,000 visitors. So, you know, just the sheer volume of people coming and doing whiskey tourism now has changed massively over the years. I, I can't even imagine in, you know, 2001, it's like you kind of someone ringing the doorbell like, ooh, I wonder if they'll even answer at the <laughs> distillery. And then you open, you so see a big door opening and being like, you want a tour? You want a sip? Sure. We'll make something up, you know, kind of that, that, that <laughs> way back when, you know. Yeah, and it really, it was almost that. And it was, you know, uh-huh. it was very much, you know, the, 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 the distillery had the freedom to create what it was. Now, you know, the, the, the fingerprints of the brand are all over it. And you can see the development of that, which which is good and bad. You know, it, it, the good side of it is there's a little bit more money to spend on development and creating uh, something a little bit more shiny uh, for the tourists. But it's um, it, we're lucky here that we keep a, a great level of authenticity here at Glen Murray, which I'm really proud of. Um, mm. And people, you know, it's warts and all. You know, we're, we're not, you know, there's no smoke and mirrors applied. You get to see all aspects of Glen Murray when you come and see it. And, you know, that's that's exciting. And I think that's an interesting part for the tourist. No, absolutely. Now, um, why did you decide to make the switch from um, uh, the McAllen to Glen Murray? I, it was an exciting opportunity. Um, you know, at McAllen, it was very much focused on the visitor center. Uh, you know, much bigger brand, bigger team. Uh, so your involvement or your, your kind of ability to, to kind of branch out and learn more about the industry was slightly hampered. You know, there was always some fantastic career development there. Uh, but here, just, you know, you, it was a smaller team, so you, you kind of had to wear many, many hats. And that's what's kept this job exciting over the last 18 years. It's no two days are the same. You know, just a few, few weeks ago, it was, um, you know, I was doing a tour of the States um you know doing a whiskey festival in las vegas which was super exciting and then next week i'll be here um you know doing the the annual year-end stock check counting you know pens sold in the visitor center and things like that <laughs> so you know it's, it's very much still hands-on it's very much involved you know i get very work very closely with our marketing team which are a great bunch of people uh so you know it's, it's just um you know a little bit more freedom uh, to be involved in all aspects of the business well, let's jump into the history of Glen Murray because I really don't know that much about it. And looking online, of course, there's something about Wikipedia tells a teeny bit, ta- well, tells a teeny tale. But I'd love to hear, you know, the because I, you know, you sell a lot of liquid. So how did it start? So we, uh, you know, this year we celebrated our 125th anniversary. So back in uh, October this year, the distillery. Congratulations. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's been, I haven't been there that long, so it's just a small part <laughs> of this history. Um, but it's, you know, it started off uh, as a brewery. 
Uh, so the distillery wasn't you know, purpose built as a distillery. So a lot of um, what we had was kind of squeezed into places that weren't designed for stills and that. So um, that, you know, it, it makes it slightly quirky. And over the years, you know, it's grown and it's uh, developed. And, there's, you know, a lot of the history of Glen Murray, a lot of the change in the history of Glen Murray has been in the recent history. Um, you know, back in 2008, the, the business was sold um, by LVMH, Louis Vuitton Moe Hennessy, uh, to another. So it was a French to French sale to La Martini Kez. And they've invested hugely in the, in the brand, in the distillery, in the production, and the people. You know, we've expanded uh, numbers here at the distillery uh, as a headcount of people working here. We've expanded production. Um, when I started back in 2005, we produced 2 million litres. We now produce 6 million, but next year we'll be at 8.5. We're going are about to undergo a further expansion. Um, we exported to 12 markets around the world. We now export to 80 markets around the world. You, we used to have just the three expressions. We now have up to 20 expressions, including limited editions. So the recent history is where a lot of change has taken place here. Um, prior to that, it was a, a workhorse distillery. It was very steady production. Um, producing a lot for blending, um, mm -hmm. uh, but there was always that single malt aspect. You know, now we do both, but the the, the kind of um, uh, the, the single malt has taken a, a greater level of focus now within the distillery, which is which is fun, which is an exciting thing to have around the distillery. Uh, when it was, uh, as you said, kind of a, a workhorse for blend blending, was it blending its own, or was it selling it out to for others to blend? Uh, both. So we would have been a key component in company blends uh, at the time. You know, one of the, the, the most famous ones would have been Bailey Nickel Jarvey, uh, BNJ. Okay. Uh, I actually don't think that blend is around anymore. It's been kind of mothballed for the time being. Uh, but that was quite a famous blend at the time that it was a real kind of component around. Um, and the rest that would have been used for a lot of reciprocal deals, swapping out to get other single malts so that we could blend with it and other companies could blend with Glen Murray. Was there just one age of the single malt that they produced or was it a, you know, a eight year, 12 year, 25 year, that kind of thing? Uh, so it was mainly the three expressions uh, for, for a long part of the, the kind of uh, production of Glen Murray. It was a, an eight year old, um, it was a 12 year old and a 16 year old. Uh, we have developed that range. Um, we, we've kind of uh, created a, a collection of non-age statement whiskies, and then we have our age range collection, which is um, a twelve, a fifteen, an eighteen, and a twenty-one. Uh, so we've expanded the range of ages, plus added additional non-age statement, and then we've got a kind of pro proliferation of um, limited edition special releases that we do on top of those. And when was the decision to start to? I don't want to say be more creative, but decide to create these limited editions, these expressions. Was it when the French company bought it? Yeah, a little bit kind of, you know, prior to that, the distillery was uh, being used as a little bit of uh, a laboratory for the, the previous owners. They were testing things out. They were putting stuff into weird and wonderful casks just to see what would happen and see how it would work. Um, but the brand wasn't developed enough that it could, um, you know, bring these out. And to be fair, the market probably wasn't ready for all these kind of uh, weird and wacky casks because uh, we did um, a Chardonnay cask back in the 1990s, uh, which was oh beautiful, wonderful. Whiskey. But it, it really wasn't well received because I don't think uh, people understood it or the, the market really wasn't ready for that kind of uh, style and approach. But um, so we were sitting on these casks. Um, the brand became a little bit more developed. It became a little bit more um, expansive in its reach around the world. So we could bring out these larger limited edition releases and you know, spread it around a little bit further. Um, so we were tapping into what was there. And all we've done is really built on that legacy of, of experimentation. But now the world gets to see it. We've just not locked it away in warehouses to forget about it anymore. I, I can't believe you said 1990. I mean... When yep. you think of what people were drinking in 1990, it was like the Cosmo, the Fuzzy Navel, the Midori Sour. You know? <laughs> and here you are bringing this this wonderful, you know, Chardonnay cask whiskey to an audience that is just like, what? I, you know, we're drinking Chardonnay in this, you know, in the in the 90s. That's that was and, so and forward thinking, really. 
It was, you know, and, and at the time, you know, it was it was Chardonnay finished. Uh, so even, you know, that term finishing wasn't created in the, the lexicon of Scotch whiskey. So we called it wine mellowed at the time. So uh, we were kind of at the it. forefront of something which has become a kind of key part of single malt whiskey going forward. Absolutely. Do you have any of that liquid left? Uh, yeah, little bits and pieces of it still sitting in warehouse. Um, uh-huh. So we've... We're, we're not at the volume, you know, of that length of maturation to allow us to do big, big releases. But we do the odd single uh-huh. cask full maturation in, Ch- in Chardonnay now uh, that we bring out, which is a part of that era and part of that period mm-hmm. of, of experimentation. So that's fun to do. So These are the fun things. No, I'm sure. And the since you've been there that long, you've, you've seen all of these uh, experiments and been part of them. Um, what have been kind of highlights of them. You don't have to go through every single one of them, but what have been the real highlights, like the first maybe that you were like, oh yeah, yeah, this is going to work. And then, you know, some others, you know, uh, that have, that you've loved. I'm the two that bookend um, the, my kind of time here that I absolutely love. One of the first releases that we did back in 2005 when I joined was uh, something called um, Mountain Oak Final Release. Uh, which was just a phenomenal whiskey. It was a whiskey which was matured in um, air seasoned, des- what was what is now called designer casks. Um, back then, we, we called it mountain oak, and it was cast. You know, air seasoning takes two years to prepare the wood, uh, so that it can be crafted uh, into an actual. What cask is air se- What What does air seasoning mean? So you just allow the wood to, to season itself. It's not, you know, force seasoned in an oven to dry it out, to get the right moisture content, to kind of create the staves that you're doing to produce the, the casks themselves. So um, it's a more natural approach. It's a longer term approach. And the casks themselves didn't have anything in them. So they were virgin wood casks. And we had left the, the spirit maturing for about 15 years. Um, and it created such a beautiful whiskey. It was, was stunning. Um, and one we did last year, um, which was a Barolo cask finish, um, finished in Italian red wine casks, which was absolutely stunning. So, you know, it was one when I first arrived and one that we just did last year, which uh, was fantastic liquid. And um, the Barolo one, um, are, is it really wet with Barolo? You know, has is it just like... They've literally just take the wine out and they send it to you. You know, how much of that is still in the cask when you put the whiskey in? So we generally get them with transport liquid. So um, there's, you know, there's a few liters in the cask uh, to keep it wet. Uh, the casks need to be, they need to retain a level of moisture so that they can maintain um, you know, solidity so that they don't collapse. If they dry out, the wood shrinks and the, the staves collapse because there's no screws or glue or nails used. Right. So you need the moisture to expand the wood and uh, keep them watertight from the inside out. So, um, you know, we need that for that reason, but also it keeps it fresh. It keeps, um, you know, a certain level of activity in the flavor profile as well. We have to tip that out. Um, legally, we can't leave that in uh, because you're, that would be classed as an additional ingredient. And within the guidance of, of producing single malt whiskey, uh, we can't have that. So we tip it out just before we fill it. So there is that level of freshness of, of the Barolo within the cask when we get it. Yeah, and you, you, you toast to your new cask with the Bar- Barolo wine. <laughs> it gets tipped down the drain, I hate to tell you. No, Always I'm only teasing you. <laughs> now, now tell me about, the. you have also, the, is that considered part of the warehouse collection and the warehouse series? So that was part of last year's releases. So we typically, or we, we have done recently, three releases every year. Uh, last year, we since, the first one was a top guy when? finish. So, uh, since um Well, last year was the, the first year that we introduced the Warehouse One, but it followed off the back of something we had called Curiosity Series. So we've kind of tweaked the Curiosity range. It's kind of moved to one side and allowed Warehouse One to come through. They're both the same, similar concept. They're about experimentation. The terminology we felt with Curiosity, we were painting ourselves into a little bit of a corner because um, there's only so much that you can find that is curious to the whiskey drinker. And we were starting to pull things out. They were curious to Glenn Murray, but on the wider kind of um, whiskey category, people had seen them before, but for us, they were a little bit different. So we changed it to Warehouse One, which is the warehouse where we keep these curiosities, we keep these experimentations. 
I always say to people that if um, you come to the Glen Murray Distillery, it's Warehouse One where we take you on the tour. So these um, curiosities are not um, secrets. They're not hidden. You can have a wander about. You can look through the warehouses. You can see them sitting there. Um, and if you see them come out, you know that they're um, successful. The ones that are not successful, they get pushed further and back, further back to the warehouse. <laughs> Um, so, you know, we, we changed it to Warehouse One, gave us a little bit more freedom with the types of casts that we could bring out. We also changed it from 46% ABV to cast strength, um, which for me was a, a great decision. So, um, you know, Warehouse One has been completely cast strength edition since um, last year. So they were, the Warehouse One's only been around since uh, 2021. Um, the three releases we did last year were a Tokai cask, uh, which was a Hungarian dessert wine. Um, then mm -hmm. we did the Barolo cask, which came out in November last year, October last year, sorry. And then in November, we took out a Manzanilla, which was a sherry cask, slightly different from the traditional Oloroso that you would normally find with a, with a whiskey uh, sherry cask. This year, um, we have released uh, the um, Oloroso full maturation. Uh, we've not done a full maturation sherry in a number of years, so it was nice to bring back something that wasn't just a finish. Finishes are great, but this was giving the cast to put a real stamp of flavour into the product. Uh, we have an Amontillado, which kind of follows the theme from last year's Manzanilla, so a slightly different quirky sherry cask. Um, and we have the Amarone as well, which again just follows that theme of an Italian red wine cask. Now, let's talk about the Tokai for a second, because that is such a sweet wine. It's so delicious. One of my favorites. How did that affect the taste of the whiskey? As you, as you would expect, it brought a lot of sweetness to the table. Um, uh, it brought a lovely kind of, um, kind of orangey kind of note to it, you know, kind of fresh uh, kind of Satsuma orange flavor to it, which was, was lovely. Um, it was brought out in the summertime and it was just a, a great summer release. Uh, so it, it, it you know, it's, it was a, it was a lovely, lovely whiskey. Sold out amazingly quickly. Uh, fortunately, we have more Tokai casks sitting in the warehouse. Interesting thing, it was only a year finish, so it only been in there for one year. Um, so the ones we have are going to be in there for much, much longer. So it'll be interesting to see how they develop because for us, we don't know. We haven't, you know, been in there that long, so we just need to see how it works out and how it develops. Have you been tasting it along the way? I, not recently, no. So we'll have to go back and check and see how they're coming along. So, oh, I'm um, so actually, interested we did, in that. We, we did. Uh, we, we have um, one really old one, which we, we sampled. I was um, doing a, a tasting out in um, uh, Berlin for BCB this year, and we sampled a really old one. We, when we get casks that we've, we're experimental with, we, we put some old stock uh, to finish and we put some kind of middle-aged stock to finish and then we put some younger just so we can see how it reacts with the different ages um, and I drew a sample of some 34 year old um, that was finishing in Tokai which is absolutely stunning uh, beautiful whiskey oh my gosh it must be so great now behind me I have a bottle of the Elgin classic um, yes what what which I was lucky enough to ha to get at an old fashioned evening a few years ago, um, I was wondering how does that you know what is that, that part of? Is that one of your age statement whiskeys? The Elgin Classic is one of our non age statements. Um, okay. So this is something again we've kind of carved a niche out for ourselves with. Um, well, no, not a niche because a lot of people are doing it now. But we were kind of one of the first distilleries to bring a non age statement into your core range. Um, so it's a mixture of ages. Uh, the average is about six. So we've got some younger and some older stock that we bring into the mix on that one. Um, and it just creates just such a wonderfully easy drinking, accessible whiskey. And, and I mean accessible from a flavor perspective, but also from a price point. You know, it's, a, it's a whiskey you can pick up in your supermarket for a wonderfully cheap price and get a great quality dram for it as well. And in fact, just this week, um, I say this week, we're in uh, the 12th of December. Uh, I just came back from the World Whiskey Awards in Edinburgh, where the Elgin Classic picked up a gold winner for the best Speyside non-age statement whiskey. So that was a nice evening to, to spend away. Congratulations. And this wasn't a setup, by the way. I just... <laughs> 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 
that just everyone who's listening, I did not set that up. That that I didn't, I didn't, I know. (laughs) How perfect. Congratulations. That's great. Now, since you brought up kind of sipping, and as I said, um, I did taste it first in an old fashioned class. Um, When you create both the blended and um, these, these special whiskeys, is there, I know, I have a feeling I know what you're going to say, but is there a way that you see it being drunk or I know I have a feeling you're going to say, oh, anyone can drink it anyway. But, you know, you know, the ones for cocktails or the, the you know, the the warehouse collection. How do you prefer, not prefer, I guess, but see them being drunk? They have to, from the outset, be whiskeys that you can sip. You know, the, the, you know okay. that has to be at the forefront of your mind. You know, if you're creating something which... You suddenly tell everybody, people every, to, to everybody that it must go in a cocktail. I, a, alarm bells start to ring to me that actually uh-huh. is it not good to drink on its own. So that's always a, is a worry. <laughs> um, but you know, if you, if you start off with a great cocktail, a great whiskey, it, it will make a great cocktail. You know, I was mm-hmm. told by a um, a mixologist once that you know, like like any good chef, if the ingredients are good, then the the, the meal is easier to make. Uh, so, you know, you start with the best ingredients and, and you can be as playful with it as you want from there. Oh, that's great. Now, what what are you allowed to tell what you're planning for the future for the next warehouses or is it secret? So, uh, well, it's not it's, it's it's a little bit of a secret because we, we've not <laughs> finalized what's coming out yet. Stephen, who's our head of whiskey creation, um, you know, him and I sat down and we kind of created a five-year plan um, a couple of years ago, and Stephen then kind of takes it from there. Uh, a lot of it's initially done on spreadsheet, looking at what casks we've got, uh, looking at what we can do first and foremost, because um, there's no point in coming out with great ideas and not actually having the casks there to, to release. So uh, that, that that's the first thing you do, but then it comes down to Stephen to, to draw the cask samples and then decide whether you know, two years ago, we made the right decision because who knows how they've matured. And he will make the final call and he may shuffle around that uh, what we'd scheduled for 2024 is, is maybe ready now and what we scheduled for 2023 is needing another year. So there'll be that final decision has to be made off the back of, you know, taking a sample out the cask, putting your nose into the glass and deciding if it's good to go. So we've not got to that stage yet. So um, Stephen will be working on that pretty hard, um, probably early part of next year, and the call will be made, and we'll take it from there. Yes, I was going to say, do you, you know, when do you announce it to the world? Do you always have the same date? Well, this year, um, sadly not. Uh, we, we do try and have a same release date, but this year, uh, <laughs> as you'll hear from anybody in the drinks industry, that the supply chain has uh been challenging so shall we yeah, use the yeah. word challenging so getting a hold of glass getting a hold of labels getting a hold of cartons that absolutely messed up with our plans completely so we normally release them throughout the year uh, this year everything had to be wait had to wait and be released as, as a set of three and we only just got them out about two or three weeks ago uh, so it's been been a bit of a, a slightly disrupted year uh, through no fault of our own we, we sometimes make mistakes but this time just the supply chain caused this issue. You, you know, it'll just make people want it more. So, you know, that's the excitement. It's kind of like when the yeah. new Harry Potter book was going to come out. No one really knew. And so it made it even more exciting. Now, I'd love to just chat a little bit about you, your role as brand ambassador and going around the world and introducing Glenn Murray to to you know whiskey lovers or just cocktail lovers around the world you know what has been maybe your surprises or you know some place where you felt oh they didn't know us and now they know us really well you know that that kind of thing I'd love to hear some of your stories yeah that's a part of job I absolutely love and what's not to love getting to getting paid to travel around the world and go to fantastic bars and share whiskey and stories with people it's it's uh you know, it's a pre- pleasure and a privilege to be able to do it. Uh, the last two years, you know, that hasn't been possible. We've used, you know, um, platforms like this, like Zoom and uh, Teams, which has been great to allow us to continue to be connected. But, um, you know, this year, 
I, I went to our, our brands team and said, look, you know, put me down for anything because the last yeah. two years we've done nothing. Uh, so, you know, at the beginning of the year, that sounded amazing. But, you know, getting to the end of the year, slightly tired. So uh, pleased to say the last trip was uh, last weekend in Frankfurt. Uh, we did uh, Inter Whiskey, which was it was uh, my first ever international trip, to be honest. So a whiskey festival I've always had a soft spot for. Um, this year has just been full on. Um, you know, we did a tour of the States. We, you know, went from uh, west to east. So uh, covering is loads of places. Um, what's been fun? What's, um, um, you know, places that have surprised, places that, you know, I wouldn't have otherwise had down um, as holiday destinations. Um, I went to Israel to do a bit of work for Glen Murray, and that was fantastic. That was absolutely eye-openingly fantastic to do. Um, we did a launch in the Dominican Republic, which again, uh, you know, got a, you know, a lot of people going to the, the, the Dominican Republic would just go to resorts and not see out and about and into Santa Domingo, getting to see these places. And, you know, you, you spend time with your importer, so they, they, they know where to go and where to take you. And it's, it's almost like having, you know, a fully paid up tour guide when you go to these places. Um, you know, everywhere from, you know, Australia was fantastic. I, I, just before COVID, I got to see Russia and I, and I hope to God that we get to see Russia again sometime soon because wonderful people and great country who loved our whiskey and seeing Moscow and St. Petersburg uh, was a great place to be just before everything kicked off there. So, um, you know, we you, you get to do things and go to places that you, you maybe otherwise wouldn't do. But, you know, I get to go to places that I would want to do. I just came back from San Francisco and Las Vegas, which was absolutely phenomenal. So, uh yeah, it's you know it, it it's a privilege to do. And um, you know, I have friends, someone I interviewed, Daniel Jones, who is the brand ambassador of Angostura, and he told me a story about yeah. Chicago where they drink Angostura literally by the glass. It's not just you know they could do a shot of Angostura and just little. And I was wondering if you have any stories like that where it just surprised you how someone somewhere drank you know Glenmore that you never thought of or. Um, or you were able to introduce them to something that they would have never tasted before? I, I've never seen Andy doing anything with our whiskey that, 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 that surprised me. Uh, Maybe you know, that's the, a good the, thing. The, <laughs> so, yeah, I think that's possibly a good thing. I'm not sure. Uh, you know, we we you know we've been experimental with cocktails here in the UK. You know, in recent years, so you know a lot of people trying it out in cocktails, which is always fun to see. I remember, mm -hmm. you know, if if you tried that when I first started in this industry 21 years ago, you've got kicked out of Scotland. But uh, you know, the, the people are quite happy to experiment and play around with cocktails now. So we've seen a lot of that, and you know, people drink it straight, people drink it over ice, and the approach changes and. Um, it depends on your climate, you know. I used to never put ice in my whiskey, but when you're in kind of places like the Dominican Republic, it's it's a slightly different climate than it here is in the frozen north of Scotland. So, you know, having a little drop of ice in it's not a bad thing. Uh, so yeah, not seen anyone doing. Yeah, absolutely, no, not seen anyone <laughs> doing anything too crazy with it. Uh, what I would say is, you know, we're we're kind of. I know our sales guys probably don't think this, but. You know, we are kind of new to a lot of these markets. So a lot of these markets don't know us. So, you know, you go out there and people don't have a preconception, you know, it, and that's kind of fun to do. That's that's what I like to see, you know, to, to go out and to kind of introduce people to Glen Murray. And we, we, we tend to surprise them, uh, which is which is always fun in a good way. Of course, of course. Now, maybe that leads us right directly into my question, one of my questions that I always ask, which is the top tip for the home bartender, or maybe this time it should be the top tip for the whiskey home drinker, the home whiskey drinker, something like that. I am well for like I I I never worked in a bar uh, well briefly when I was uh, eighteen so my my uh, abilities to make cocktails are between slim and zero so uh, I'm, I'm not going to give anybody any cocktail making tips because that could go horribly wrong um, as a long drink uh, the one that did surprise me just a very simple mix which I've done since I was introduced to it was the proper G and T which is a Glen and tonic. Uh, Glen Murray a lot as a long drink with some tonic and some ice in the summertime, particularly that bottle you've got over your shoulder there. It just works wonderfully well. You know, I always just thought tonic was made only for gin, but no, it works really good with whiskey as well. Um, when it comes to enjoying it as a single malt, um, 
you know, find what suits, you know, play around with it. You know, if you want to try it with ice, don't don't let anybody tell you how to enjoy your whiskey. It's, it's your taste buds. It's your palate. You know, the, the, you'll hear people saying, don't put water in it. Don't put ice in it. Don't do this. Don't listen to those people. Um, try it with a bit of water. Try it straight. Try it with ice. Find what suits your palate. It's there to be enjoyed. And if you like it that way, don't have anybody come and tell you you're doing it wrong. And if someone is new to Glen Murray, um, what do you think there is, you know, one in particular that is kind of the entry level whiskey that everyone needs to try first of your range? Well, the one you have behind your shoulder, again, the classic is our entry level one from a price point and flavor perspective. I like to introduce people to the 12. Uh, I think the 12 is, is our flagship single malt. Um, it's our oldest whiskey, not in the sense of the age and the cask, in the sense that we've had the 12 year old since the 1960s. And if you can get a bottle out of an auction site from 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, you'll find that it's, it's relatively similar. It'll have changed slightly, um, but not massively. And it's held its kind of form and style for, for many, many years. So that to me is our flagship and it shows um, a great expression of Glen Murray, but also it's a, a great expression of where we are in Speyside. You know, Speyside as a region is, is a, a, a famous whiskey making region, um, famous for producing a whiskey which has a lovely kind of sweet spice balance. And our 12 year old is just the epitome of that. It just, you know, encompasses what Speyside's about as well as what Glen Murray's about. Oh, I'm so glad you brought up Speyside. I'm sorry, I um, I kind of jumped over that. And um, but it's nice that you you said what exactly Speyside is. Do you have any anything else to add to that about Speyside? It, it's a mecca for whiskey fans. Uh, there's more you know whiskey distilleries here than any other part of Scotland. Uh, you know, you have some of the biggest single malt brands uh, just within uh, a stone's throw of where we are at Glen Murray. Um, and you also have Glen Murray, so that should be a mecca in its own right. Um, but it's, um, you know, it, it's it's such, like it, it's where I was born and brought up. So I've got a love for this area and region. You know, it's on the, the Murray coast. Uh, so, you know, if you like a bit of beach line, if you want to go and see some dolphins, if you like a bit of golfing, we have some amazing golf courses and um, some fantastic restaurants in the local area um, with the Copper Dog, with Oran Restaurant in Elgin, with the Druthy Cobbler um, and the Bootleggers Bothy on the, the, the coast where you can, if you're lucky, uh, see some dolphins while you enjoy some wonderful seafood. So it's, uh, you know, just such a great region um, that has, I know everybody claims to be Scotland in miniature, but I think um, uh, Speyside is, is most definitely that has that claim as well. Now, I'm going to ask my last question, which I have a feeling I know my answer for this right now after just you describing space, space hide. But if you could be anywhere drinking anything right now, what would it be and where would it be? Now, already mine would be today having a dram of Glen Murray at, in space hide at your, your whiskey experience after that description. But it's all about you. Yeah, so we, we have um, just opened our new, uh, well, I say just opened, we opened it back at the start of this year. Uh, we worked on it during lockdown. We had our uh, new Glen Murray house experience. So we took an old house on site and we converted it into a place where you can uh, have private tastings. One of them has um, a, a wood burning fire, which you can sit beside and have a dram there. So that, that would be one of the places. But Given it's actually minus six today, um, I wouldn't mind being somewhere where it's sunny, <laughs> enjoying a dram uh, with friends with a bit of sunshine. So uh, either of those are good options. But, you know, having to go out into the cold, the sunshine is very tempting. Yeah, maybe back in the Dominican Republic. Yeah, I'm not going to. I wouldn't say no to that right now. <laughs> Well, listen, thank you so much, Ian, for being on the show. I'm sorry it's taken so long for us to get together. It was really great having you, and it was so great to hear about Glen Murray. Excellent. It was a pleasure. Thank you. 